Ori and the Blind Forest is a 2D Metroidvania style action platformer developed by Moon Studios and published by Microsoft Studios. When it was released in 2015 it received critical acclaim for its art style. In this screencast I will be looking in depth at some of the main contributing factors to its success in creating an immersive world. Ori and the Blind Forest's art style is a very bright and colourful display of 2D graphics reminiscent of some Disney and Ghibli films. The lead animator James Benson stated that they wanted to capture the fairy tale like tone of various Miyazaki movies with rather simple and plain character designs imposed on top of very lush, detailed hand painted backgrounds. In particular, they took a lot of inspiration from the Spirit Field Forest in Princess Mononoke because of the obvious similarities in environment. We wanted to hit the same aesthetical tone as these films, but also the same emotional tone and moral ambiguity. They aim for the whole game to look as if it were a moving painting, and in a way it is. All of the background art is almost entirely made up of hand-drawn assets. They claim that almost none of the assets are reused, having over 7,000 unique hand-painted graphics, although I'm not sure how accurate that really is. But this means that almost every tree, bush and everything else is completely unique, helping make each zone have a completely different tone and atmosphere, which for a metroidvania is very important to help make the world seem more expansive and give a better sense of regression throughout it. Much like many other 2D platformers, they try to achieve a sense of depth to their world by arranging their graphics in a set of layers, and by using techniques such as parallax scrolling and blur, they try to simulate a depth of field effect to blend the backgrounds together and make the environment seem more 3D. Some games that use this layering effect, such as Playdead's Limbo, will only use a few layers, which keeps the layers looking very far away from each other, and makes it easy for us to tell them apart. This works really well for Limbo with its simple silhouetted style, but in Ori and the Blind Forest they use a lot more layers to try and smooth the effect and disguise it, even if just a little bit. They use the parallax scrolling differently on each layer. The furthest away will appear to barely move along with the player at all, but each one closer will move in the opposite direction to the character, faster than the layer before it until the foreground in front of the character that will scroll even faster than the centre playable area. And with an added blur effect, this finishes off the effect of depth. This is sometimes used very effectively to introduce something slightly sinister, and to show when Ori can't quite make out something far away. That's how the scenery is set out, but what really brings the forest and world to life is the animation of all these assets, in particular how they respond to the player. All of the foliage, such as leaves and trees, bushes, or even grass, use a kind of squash and stretch animation to simulate them blowing in the wind. Almost every aspect of the background, and even in the foreground, will use this effect. It really makes the forest feel like it's active, rather than just a series of static walls and platforms. What makes this most effective is how these animations can react to or be triggered by the player. Many of the services and platforms you use to get around will move, bob, or sway when the player touches them, simulating some physics. Even the shrubbery or plant life on the platforms will react to the player moving through them, but they will also react to other things like some particle effects or NPCs, in the same way, and sometimes in a more violent way. And it is this way of responding to the player's actions which makes these animations so effective at immersing the player into the world. A similar form of squash and stretch animation is used on the characters and their movement, to add some fluidity and also to match up with the environmental animations so they don't seem out of place. The squash and stretch technique was listed as the most important of the 12 principles of animation in Disney Animation The Illusion of Life by Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas. Squash and stretch is a fundamental part of reality. It shows the interplay and reactions of objects to external forces like speed, gravity and stress. When Ori lands a jump, he squashes down to almost a quarter of his original size, and when he is at the climax of his jump, he is almost twice as tall, and his tail almost twice as long. The squishing and stretching of his body makes jumps feel so much more fluid and almost more fast paced as there is more movement happening than just directional. I believe this is almost essential for any fast paced platformer as it keeps a sense of momentum and general makes the movement much more satisfying or simply more fun. For example in Clever Endeavor's game Ultimate Chicken Horse, the characters do not use this squash and stretch animation and the movement feels rather stiff and slow, in particular this tends to make it lack much sense of momentum which can lead to players misjudging jumps and occasionally making mistakes. Although Chicken Horse gets away with it, thanks to its very simplistic art style, and most of the enjoyment comes from the multiplayer mechanics rather than the platforming itself, so it isn't as necessary. What's most interesting about this being used on the characters as well, is that they're actually 3D models disguised to look like 2D animation. At the GDC Game Developers Conference in 2015, James Benson gave a talk where he explains a lot of the process of how and why they did this. He stated this is a shot from Princess Mononoke, where there is a curse on this guy's hand and it's actually done in 3D rendering, 
but they do a really good job of tricking you into not really noticing that. We wanted to pull off a technical trick they're doing, basically taking this snake arm thing and do that through basically every asset in the game. In the animated film, the 3D is disguised by simulating outlines and very basic shadows on the worms, in a sort of cell shaded style, but with Ori there isn't any outline so they had to use some different methods. The model for Ori is almost a completely bright white silhouette. This means that even with the camera zoomed out so far, he is still very readable even among the super detailed backgrounds. Giving Ori a tail means that even while silhouetted and zoomed far out, you can still read the direction of movement, helping making the platforming more intuitive. His model only has one diffuse texture, with some very minor shadows on it, to give him a little bit of form, but keeping him very simple. Because of the lack of details, the depth on his body is hard to tell from the distance, making him look flat. But most importantly, all of his animations are rendered from an orthographic side angle, without any perspective hiding the other side of his body and head. The final touch in disguising the 3D is the lighting. On the characters, they sometimes use a kind of additive layer mask, to create directional lighting, so the environmental lighting will affect one side of the character, and because the character has already been rendered into sprites at this point, the lighting ignores the shaping of the model and gives it a flat overlay of lighting, adding to the 2D illusion, and ever so slightly merge them into the environment. In Ori's case, he is a light source himself, and the environmental pieces receive the same lighting effect. From the fantastically detailed backgrounds to the super fluid animations and eerie lighting, I believe that thanks to all of these small techniques and tricks, Ori in the Blind Forest easily manages to capture the Ghibli-esque fairy tale aesthetic and successfully manages to blend its 3D and 2D animation, making it one of the most visually pleasing games I have ever played.